I'm Johan, I'm Swedish, and I currently live and work in the UK. I'm a maintainer of uh, various open source repositories, uh, including the gRPC Gateway and Improbable's gRPC Web project. Uh, I've contributed to the Go standard library, and, I'm, and I run a blog writing mainly about Go and gRPC. This is my third GovCon UK, and it's great to be here as a speaker for the first time. And I'm here today to talk about HTTP slash JSON and gRPC. So today, we're going to look at what HTTP slash JSON is, what it's used for, and explore some problems associated with it. We're then going to go a little into protobuf and gRPC before learning about how we can get the best of both worlds with the gRPC gateway. We'll then have some live demo of it in action at the end. What do we mean when we say HTTP slash JSON? We mean a RESTful interface, making use of the HTTP verbs get, post, put, patch, and delete, and using JSON as the payload content type. This is the de facto standard for most public APIs today. Sometimes it's not entirely RESTful, but it's almost always using JSON. It's easy for humans to read and write. It's got native JavaScript support. All is well, right? Is everything well? As anyone who's ever had to quick, quickly push a configuration fix to your JSON configured service knows, trailing comments are forbidden in JSON. <laughs> I wish I was joking in saying that this is a big problem, but entirely new formats have been developed to deal with this problem. There's also no support for comments. It's unnecessarily verbose on the wire, but Compush can help mitigate some of this. Uh, in large deployments, the marshalling and unmarshalling of JSON is a constant strain on response latency. Most importantly, it's not well typed enough and there's no single way to define the interface types. OpenAPI is an option, but it's not globally adopted. Most, pro most of these problems stem from the fact that JSON was designed to be human readable, but also effective for a machine to use. These two properties are, unfortunately, incompatible. Fortunately, there is a better option. Protocol buffers have recently become more and more popular for use with internal APIs, and for good reason. They provide an efficient wire encoding, cheap marshalling and good type support, and a single source of truth for your API descriptions. Generators use the protobuf definitions to produce language-specific code. Projects such as twerp are basically the traditional HTTP slash JSON application with the JSON part replaced with protobuf. This snippet here on the screen is an example of what a very simple protofile might look like. We define the user type and a single field ID of type string. And we're going to using, be using it with gRPC. gRPC is an RPC framework developed to make RPC as fast and as safe as possible. It uses HTTP2 by default to efficiently and quickly send the data between client and server, removing, removing most of the overhead of HTTP 1.1. It uses protobuf as the default transport encoding, piggybacking on it for type safety and speedy marshalling. It is possible to use JSON with gRPC if you really want to, but it's kind of pointless. It maps the service definitions in a protofile to API services in the generated files. As we can see, we've added some extra messages for inputs, and we defined a new service with two methods. Given just this, we can generate everything we need to allow the use of gRPC between a client and a server. Note that list user streams, streams the results of the operations to the client, something which is not trivial to accomplish with HTTP slash JSON. But if you were already able to use gRPC, you wouldn't be going to this talk. Unfortunately, it's not always so easy to switch entire application stacks to a new framework. Often, there are a number of reasons why we keep using old standards when new, better alternatives are available, such as compatibility with existing systems, management pressure, and in this case, the still prevalent expectation that a public API should be using HTTP slash JSON. So what can we do when we want to use gRPC but are forced to use HTTP slash JSON? The gRPC Gateway project allows you to design gRPC and HTTP slash JSON services at the same time. It uses a custom protobuf generator that generates a simple reverse proxy that translates on the fly from JSON to protobuf and back again. It allows you to define a URL path and the HTTP verb to gRPC service method mapping with a simple annotation scheme in the protofiles. It also provides a Swagger slash OpenAPI generator in case you have some generator you want to use that requires the OpenAPI format. I've added the HTTP slash JSON annotations to the previously defined service methods above, 
And as you can see, the HTTP verb and URL path mappings are defined within the RPC definitions. How does it work under the hood? So this image is pretty busy, but it shows roughly the overview of the architecture of the GRPC gateway. You generate a GRPC. I have a pointer here, but it's too bright. You generate a GRPC. I can point this. You generate a GRPC uh, thing uh, with a normal protec, uh, GRPC generator, and you also generate a a little proxy with the GRPC protec gen GRPC generator, and then you kind of just start a proxy, and it serves a HTTP REST interface, and it in the background translates your JSON requests into protobuf sends it to the GRPC service, and then translates it back again on the way out. So it's, the architecture is very simple. But this is not all that interesting. So let's take a look at an example. <clears throat> I'm going to show you an example of the GRPC gateway from my boilerplate repo. And if you have a laptop at hand, I see at least one here, <laughs> you can feel free to uh, clone the repository and follow along if you like. So. Uh, where are we? This one. OK. I'm going to enlarge this a little bit. That's, that's about done. Oh, <clears throat> Can everyone see that at the back? Thumbs up? Right. OK, so what we've got here is a proto file. And at the top, we've got a proto definition. Um, sorry, the, the proto syntax declaration, uh, a package. Uh, clause and uh, some imports and stuff. All of this is, is not all that uh, important right now. What we've got down here is a uh, open API annotation that you can use for creating uh, links uh, in the generated open API file. And uh, you can also define the scheme. And we'll see what this means uh, a little bit later on when we're going to run this. And then the, the important part here is the uh, user service, which defines the service that we're going to expose. So we have as an RPC method add user here, which takes an add user request and returns a user. And uh, we can see here that we've added an annotation that means that if we send a HTTP 101 request to this path using the post verb, then that will be mapped to the gRPC method add user. And uh, the body is used to parse into the add user request type. And you can also see that we've got a little annotation here, which just, again, adds a little bit to the generated open API uh, file. And then we've also got the list users method, uh, which takes a list users request and returns a stream of users. And we'll see a little bit later on what that means exactly. But, and then you can see the HTTP mapping here. Uh, the, if you make a get verb request to the API slash v1 slash users method, it will be calling the GRPC list users request. And again, some annotations here. And as you can see, the add user request and list user requests are both very simple. There are actually no parameters to these functions right now. And the only property that I have on a user is a single ID. So let's take a look at what this looks like when we run it. OK, and that will start the GRPC server. And uh, I'm going to have to move this across. Here we go. This is a open API UI running in uh, my Firefox. Uh, and, and all of this is entirely generated from the file that we just saw, right? It generates an open API file. And in this case, this is being uh, interpreted, the, the JSON open API file is being interpreted by the open API uh, web interface. And uh, you can see we have. We can see the get users method, and we can see the list, uh, the, sorry, the add user method and list user method. And if we just try running this, uh, it doesn't take any parameters, so we don't need to specify anything. Execute. OK, we get an ID back. Great. Let's just create another one. OK, we get another ID back. And if we go back up again, we can list users. And remember, this returns a stream. Now, the GFC gateway, uh, th this uh, Swagger interface does not support uh, kind of streaming the results back as they come in. But the, uh, the GFC gateway does. So if we were adding something like a sleep to show that this is actually streaming the result, it wouldn't look very good in this demo. But suffice it to say that we have returned both of the results here uh, in the stream. And you can also see that there's a bit of a wrapper here uh, in case there's like an error in, in the second message in the stream. Anyway, so that's what it currently looks like. But what if 
we so so showing a demo that is like just checked out and precompiled is not that interesting, right? So let's add something to this. Let's say management has requested that we store an email address with each user. So obviously, then we just go down to the user property, uh, the user message, and we say, okay, we need to store an email. And if you're new to Proto, Proto uh, Buffers, then you'll see that there are numbers here. And the only thing you need to really worry about is that you don't have duplicate numbers within the same message. Uh, you don't need to ne know anything else, and it's not that important if you're not um, particularly interested in the internals of Protobuf. And obviously, in order to set to this email, we'll need to provide it on, in the add user request. So let's add a let's add a parameter here, and that's all there is to it. So now we just generate the files. So we will call a couple of different generators. Boom, it's done already. Um, we can take a look at the server. Uh, let me restart the language server because we've just had the new files. Uh, and uh, so there's the server that we I forgot to look at earlier. <laughs> uh, you can see the add user and the list user method here are implementing the gRPC interface. And indeed, this is a gRPC server and a gRPC uh, a HTTP JSON server. Uh, but for the purposes of the server implementation, all we need to care about is implementing the gRPC interface. And uh, now that we've added the email field here, we can we can take a look at the add user request. Yep, we have an email. So let's uh, add that to the uh, user, which also stores an email now, of course. <coughs> oh, whoops. And that's basically all there is to it. As you can see, the list users method just blocks a mutex and sends uh, loops over the users and sends the user one by one out. So an interesting observation here. If you have a, like an extremely large list of users and you want to keep them in memory, but you don't want to send a huge request, this will stream user one by one, right? Pretty cool. OK, so <clears throat> we added a field. Let's, let's build this, see if it, uh, if it does what, it, what I've promised. Let's reload this, disabling the cache. Oops. Is that what I wanted? Yeah, that is what I wanted. OK. Now, if we add a user, then we've got an email property, um, field here. So let's add a new user with the email. OK. <clears throat> and there you go. You can see the email was obviously uh, returned in the response, so it's been parsed correctly and, and sent back out again. And if we list users, then you can see that the, the, the email was also persisted to the back end, in this case, an in-memory back end, obviously. <clears throat> so again, like adding a field is also not that impressive. But what if we need to add an entirely new method? Management has just requested that we be able to get a single user by their ID. OK, so obviously, for writing a RESTful service here, we will write a get user method. Uh, the get user method will look pretty similar to uh, add user method. So I will pick up the most powerful tool in my programmer's toolbox, copy paste, and add a new method. Look at that, search replace. Beautiful. OK, obviously, this is not a post. We are we're now making a get request. and we can't use this path because this path is used by the list method. So what we really want to be able to do is say we want to use a path that uh, also allows us to provide a, a user ID at the same time. Well, great news. You can do path um, interpolation like so. And obviously, the get request is not going to have a body. So we can delete that. Let's make sure the documentation is correct. And so what does this user ID map to? Well, we haven't yet created the get user request message. So let's copy that name, and we'll add it on the bottom here. And the important thing now that you're using path interpolation is that you have a field here that maps to the name that you used in the path. So we need to make sure that this user ID here 
is also available in the get user request, which it is. So having done that, let's generate again. And this, this runs the Proto-C compiler with the GRPC gateway um, plugin, the Go plugin, and the Swagger plugin, and also generates some static assets. And now if we go run, oh, sorry, of course, we're going to have to implement the back end as well. We added this, um, a new method. We're going to have to, this, is, this isn't going to compile anymore because uh, the GRPC server interface requires that we implement the entire uh, interface, which is including a new uh, get user method. Of course, I'm going to restart the language server again because we've generated the files. And again, uh, we can make use of <laughs> copy paste to save us some time here because these methods look pretty similar. Um, <laughs> and in, th in this case, we don't need to uh, use the uh, write lock, so we can use a, a read lock. And uh, the rest of this logic we can copy from uh, the list users method, because we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do a linear search and try and find the, the user that the, uh, the client is requesting. So we can just look up the ID of, of uh, each user here, and simply check if user dot get ID equals dot get user ID. Then we simply return the user. And but if we get all the way down here, then we've looped through the entire list of users and we haven't found any users, so we're going to have to return an error. And when we're working with gRPC, we use the status package and the, the status codes to write errors. So uh, obviously, if we were just writing a HTTP REST server, then we, were returning, uh, we would return a 404 here. But we're writing a REST and gRPC server. So we have to, in, in this case, uh, gRPC obviously takes precedence. But we'll see soon that it's all good. So user could not be found. Let's see if this compiles. You guys are probably have a better view of this code than I do. Yes, it compiles. OK. Whew. I did this at the London Meetup once, and it was like there was a small error in there, and I didn't notice until Ant Antonio pointed it out to me. OK. And uh, again, let's reload this page with the uh, cache disabled to make sure we get the new version. And now you can see we have a new method here, the get user method. And if we if we let's just see what happens if we try and get a user and 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 there aren't any users uh, because we said we wanted to return a 404 before we but we returned a codes dot not found and what does that mean anyway? Uh, but if we if we call this then we can see we get a 404 error. We also get um, kind of quite a lot of information here. We're going to look a little bit into error handling in a minute, but uh, that all maps really nicely, right? So if you were making a GRPC server call, a uh, client call to the server, you'd get a codes.not found, which is appropriate in that context. But if you're making a HTTP call, you're getting a 404, which is appropriate in that context. So the GRPC gateway takes care of that translation automatically. Uh, OK, so let's add a user and just see that this actually works as well. Uh, we don't have to set the email. This is, let's just run it and then grab the ID from the response. Oh my goodness. Wow. <clears throat> and if we try and call this, then it should work. Yes, OK, so we're getting the user back. And you can see here that the request URL is, includes the user. So we've, we've done uh, parameter interpolation in the uh, URL, which is really neat. OK, that's, that's just showing kind of the basic usages of the um, gateway. But let's take a look at some more specific features of the gateway, starting with the so-called well-known types. These types are part of what you might call a protobuf standard library and are always included with the Proto-C compiler, meaning you don't have to manually manage their downloading and generation. They use a special namespace, google.protobuf, which makes them easy to recognize. These types are predefined messages and include messages for handling timestamps, durations, uh, wrappers of primitive types, and others. All of these types have special cases built into them for the gateway. So whenever, for example, you need a timestamp, make sure to use the well-known type. As you can see here, I've added some examples of the uh, 
examples of well-known times. The, the timestamp type marshals to RFC 3339 timestamp. Uh, the uin32 value can be used to have nullable uin32s, and the struct type can be used to store arbitrary JSON structures. Please use the last one carefully, as the protobuf representation is an entire mess to work with, and you should only use it as a last resort, and why do you need free from JSON anyway? Okay, so let's take a look at this in action. Let's get rid of all that hard work. And let's uh, check out my prepared branch. At this point, uh, the live demo typing became a little bit too much. So I've prepared some branches. So let's go back to the proto file again. Uh, the, we still have uh, uh, add user, get user, and list user here. And we've also added some properties to the user uh, message. And we've also added a, a metadata field to the add user request. So the, as you can see, this is a google.protobuf.struct type, which means we can put in arbitrary JSON. Uh, so let's see what this looks like when we run it. Is this way too small? Anyway, OK. So now we have the add user method taking a, a metadata field, which appropriately is an entirely free from uh, JSON type at the moment. So let's just put something there. And then in the metadata, we can put anything we like. And, but I'm just going to put something simple, and a string key and a number here. And just to show you that this works. And there we go. We can see that the method, uh, the create time was automatically marshaled to a, a RFC 3339 timestamp, uh, suitable for using JSON, obviously, and, and JavaScript. The, uh, the metadata has been returned uh, verbatim as it was input. And, but the magic that you're not seeing here is that it was turned into protobuf and then back again. And the JSON to protobuf mapping is sometimes a little bit temperamental. Uh, but you can use this type if you really need kind of freeform messaging. OK. There's a, another well-known type that has a special use in the gateway, which deserved a specific example. Most primitive, protobuf primitive fields, such as strings and integers, are non-nullable. So in order to do partial updates, the best practice is the use of a special message type called a field mask. Exposing this implementation detail, however, to the users is pretty nasty. So the grpc gateway supports translating JSON fields to a field mask and resource type. Fields that are found in the input JSON are populated, used to populate the resource and field mask automatically. <coughs> this code shows an example structure with the service uh, omitted because I couldn't fit it on the slide. The output only comments indicate that the field is not mutable via partial updates, which is in line with the Google API design docs recommendations. This support was entirely the result of an open source contribution from Roman, Azami, and Daniel McDonald. So let's take a look at an example. <coughs> so now, with the in the proto file, we've added an update user method. And you can see that this one uh, is even a little bit more complicated than the get user method was. We have a uh, patch verb root mapping from the user.id. And in this case, we're not using uh, a single user underscore ID. The dot is a separator for fields. So what we're saying here is that on the update user request, there must be a field called user. And on that field, there must be a property called ID. But it means, and, and in the body, we want to interpret it straight into the user field uh, of the request type. But it, what this means is that the update user request looks as nice as this. We say, OK, this is the user property, the user field. And then we have a field mask here, which you, as a GRPC gateway user, don't really have to worry about. And if you're exposing a GRPC interface, then they will be setting this manually anyway, because it's how you're supposed to be doing partial updates in GRPC. Uh, and we have added these output-only comments, <coughs> which, again, is in line with the recommendations from the Google API design guidelines. And the GRPC gateway generator parses the comments and then will 
and you'll see in, in the example that only those that are not output only will show up in uh, the JSON. So we're saying that the ID is output only. Obviously, it's an immutable identifier. Uh, the, the create time is also obviously immutable, and uh, we don't want to set the metadata here, but the email is not output only. So we should be able to do a partial update on the email. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So you'll notice here now that we have an update user method. Uh, it's got a nice colorful patch text. And if we first add a user so that we can later update it, and we'll ignore the metadata for now, <coughs> we get back the user itself, obviously, and we're going to need to have the ID handle in order to update it. We scroll all the way up here. And again, you can see that the ID is uh, interpolated from the path. So we'll put this in the path. And then, as you can see, only the email string here is populated, uh, which is a nice uh, indicator that this is the only one that's actually mutable. And management has just decreed that Johan was fired. So we're going to change his email to bob at whatever.com because he has taken his place. Uh, but the user is obviously still the same. So if we run that, we get a, a nice, friendly update back. We can see the create time. OK, if you were paying attention, the create time hasn't changed. The metadata hasn't changed. Uh, the ID hasn't changed. But indeed, the email has changed. So we successfully performed the partial update there. And you can see how seamless this is, right? You can send uh, a JSON request, and it automatically populates the um, field mask for you. Oh, OK, I just realized I forgot to show the backend implementation. So the backend implementation is. Um, Again, this is written uh, to um, primarily target gRPC, but the gRPC uh, gateway makes it so easy to, to work with, uh, courtesy of this uh, field mask translation. So let's go over this quickly. I've already shown what it looks like in an example, but uh, this is the implementation. So in, we're obviously doing a, a linear search here to find the user, and if we didn't find the user, we return an error. Then we uh, iterate over the paths that are provided in the field mask. And in this case, the only path that we allow is the email path. And any other paths are return, return invalid arguments error. And as you can see, that was working, and it updated the, the user. So you can, you can trust me when I say that code works. <clears throat> OK, so one final example. How do we handle errors in our service? We touched upon this a little bit earlier. When working with gRPC, we use the status type for errors, which includes a message and a code. The gRPC gateway automatically translates the code into appropriate HTTP status codes according to the google.rpc.codes definitions. Here we can see a sample of the error codes and their mappings. And as you can see, invalid argument to 400, um, not found to 404, as we noticed, etc. There's about 15 different codes, and they all map to reasonable HTTP codes. If you have more specific needs for your error handling, however, such as custom error format, uh, you can create your own error handling function and assign it to runtime.http error. And uh, this should only ever be done in an init function, uh, since this method is used by the runtime to respond to requests. Now let's quickly see what that looks like. I can see we're actually running out of time a little bit here, but uh, so let me br be brief. We, in this case, uh, we already saw what the error looked like when uh, we didn't have a custom error handler. So what I've done here is I've created a custom error handler, and I'm signing to it in the main file in an init function. The custom error handler, in this case, what we want to do is just make it a little bit briefer. Because you saw that the JSON structure of the default error includes a message, which has the error message. It includes an error, which has the same error message. It includes a details array, which doesn't have anything in this case. And it includes a code, which doesn't mean anything to your REST users. So what you can do here is take the error, convert it to a status, which is always going to succeed, basically. Uh, you can then map the code in the error to a HTTP status code. So for example, codes.notfound maps to 404. And you can write the uh, header, and then we just, we just write the message to the uh, the wire. So let's let's just show a quick example of what that looks like. We 
will we'll make another get user request without having created a user, uh, just to see that we're getting a much nicer error this time. OK, so as you can see now, the only thing we're printing here is the, the error verbatim. This isn't JSON, obviously, so any JSON customers are going to be very upset with you. But uh, the key is that you can format this any way you like, right? Very useful. OK, so wrapping up, what we've done here today is we've created a HTTP slash JSON service, but we've used gRPC and protobuf under the hood. This allows us to get all the benefits of the protobuf IDL while still exposing the JSON interface externally. We've also managed to sneak a gRPC service into our stack, and now it's much easier to argue that gRPC might be something worth trying. New clients can use gRPC, and old clients can keep using JSON. Most importantly, we found an easy, robust way to write RESTful Go services, and we've only explored a snapshot of all that the gRPC gateway has to offer. Other features include the ability to set cookies, perform header-based authentication in interceptors, analogous to HTTP middleware, and much more. I hope you will, as I do, use the gRPC gateway for your next HTTP slash JSON service. Thank you.